Dr. Joe Ciotola, our health officer for his uh, Department of Health update. Good evening. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Being the optimist that I am, <laughs> we're going to start with fiscal year 22. All right. And he has nothing but good news for us. We'll skip over that one. But I'd like to say that the year-end report for fiscal year 21, and we're going to go over it with COVID activity. Because as you all know, from March of 2020 until June of 2021, the health department was essentially doing one thing, chasing COVID. And we're still chasing COVID. But I want to be optimistic about what the health department is doing for the citizens of Queen Anne. But I have to say this now and say it to all of the individuals that work for Queen Anne County. Without their support, their diligent dedication to their, what they did during the past 21 year, being in that state of emergency, stepping in, all hands on deck, doing what we had to do to test, to quarantine, to vaccinate. Thank you, all of you, EMS, housing, transportation, <coughs> zoning and planning, park and rec, every single department in this county stepped to the plate. And gentlemen, so did you. And thank you. Bottom of our heart. It's been a struggle. We've had significant turnover in personnel at the health department because of retirement or just burnout. And trying to recruit, as most businesses know, but trying to recruit for a state position is extremely difficult. But we're going to do it, and we're going to get through this. Now, what are we going to do in 2022? First off, we look at our census. <clears throat> and that demographic shows that, surprisingly, our population is 49,874. We've always been thinking that we were around 52, 54. This data, and I even talked to Heather Canale about it this, this afternoon. I think that realistically with COVID, we have a fault in census. I think that there were a lot of individuals that one didn't get accounted for. And when you look at our demographics, yeah, 90% essentially Caucasian. African-American, about 6.3. And our other races, which are essentially our Hispanic population, is about 4%. But we know that we have larger amount in both of those lower populations because we see them, we take care of them, we know it, they're working here. That gives us an indication of where we are population-wise. Because when we talk about percentage of that vaccination and comparison of vaccination for COVID and comparison to vaccination for what we do yearly on flu, I think it gives you a pretty good idea of where we are with the population. Now, health outcomes. Queen Anne is number six in the state on health outcomes. We have a rather healthy overall population. Now, is that going to change as we do more 55 and older, more assisted living facilities? Yes, but to what degree? We don't really know. We do know that there will be an increase in medical needs. And what really does concern me when you look at statistics and you get down to this specific 
This statistic of primary care physicians, access to health care, dental, and look at mental health. We have one behavioral health, mental health provider per 950 people. Look at our primary care. One doc is supposed to be responsible for 2,800 people. To say that we have a paucity in health care availability is certainly truthful. Doc, real quick, um, to that point, because we also have such a transient workforce here going across to Bridge, it's, do they take that into account that, yeah, my doctor isn't here in Queen Anne's County, but I may be getting medical or dental care in Anne Arundel or Montgomery or Howard. Do they? I mean, We're how do basically they... lumped in that luminous health care and sure regional health care. Okay. So there's, you've got practices that are owned by both medical corporations that have offices here, but also the specialty now is across the bridge. Mm -hmm. And you even see that with Shore, when Shore Regional Health, University of Maryland, Shore Regional Health, needs specialty care, where are they going? They're going across the bridge. Right. But the count itself is physical offices and personnel providing care in the jurisdiction, as far as I know. That's the way it normally would be done, by a geographical location. Okay. Some health factors that we're going to work on this year in the health department. It's jumping over. But the health factors we're going to work on, we're going to work on adult and childhood obesity. We're going to try and make an inroad into the pre-diabetic and diabetic population and outcomes for those individuals. The leading cause of renal disease is uncontrolled diabetes, leading to renal failure, hypertension, congestive heart failure, cardiac disease, and eventually death. The other major component that we need to really focus on, alcohol impaired driving deaths and our alcohol and drug use. And thankfully, our addiction programs and our behavioral health programs, and certainly with the help of going purple, with the Drug-Free Coalition, the support of the Drug-Free Coalition by the commissioners and the community, we need to address our opioid issues. And our primary problem now is fentanyl. And looking at what's happening in our southern border, I think that we need to be very, very diligent and observant as to the supply chain that may drift this way with fentanyl. But we're going to work with these, and some of those things will happen over a period of time. We're developing a process of community outreach. We've started a whole new division in the health department that is focusing on education, screening, and trying to truly address hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. We're working with the school system, the Board of Ed, to try and get wellness centers into our schools, specifically with Choptank Community Health. And if we can do that in our Title I schools as a pilot program in the Northern County, that's what we're focusing on and working forward in conjunction with the Board of Ed and Dr. Salins. We'll be to try it out there and then then move to the schools. Yep. And I, and, and I got a preview of it when we had our MAKO Board of Directors meeting, the new one in Greensboro, and it's a phenomenal. And I know Doc's been, ever since I got back and mentioned to Todd, and they've been working on it, I'm telling you, it's a phenomenal program. It really helps to, you know, fill some gaps here and there where you Bill, can. It fills a real significant gap in our northern community. And, and the preventative care is so essential to saving money on health care and so Houston's many other, calls, it's everything amazing. else. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just really stuff. so much is preventable. Now, October one started flu season, mm -hmm. and we've already been putting the flu shots in. We've already been doing the flu mist for the pediatric population. The nurses have been going to the schools to try and catch the children up in their normal vaccinations. 
because with last year, we lost a year, folks. So we've got to catch up, and that's what we're doing. We're doing flu vaccines at the health department, and uh, go to the health department website. We're usually doing them on Tuesdays, and so they sign up on the website. Yep. Then they get the appointment. Then they yep. go in. Go in. Same thing for COVID. If they want, we'll that get vaccine. we'll okay. get to COVID, but we're doing both. Okay, we will do both a flu vaccine or a booster for those individuals that qualify for a booster with Pfizer and quote unquote the third dose for the Moderna we will also do. We're trying to do J and J for those individuals that only want one shot, but we are doing combined flu vaccine, COVID, and we're doing it in one shoulder on one side, other shoulder gets the other. I know you're allowed to do it in the same deltoid muscle, but I'd prefer knowing which arm started to have a reaction if we had one. Emergency those boosters are available now, Doc? Hmm? Are those boosters available yes. now? Yes. For, there's no age restriction. Well. You can't cross vaccinate that, right? Can you? No, you cannot cross. The only ones is for boosters, technically, is Pfizer. Pfizer. Is Pfizer? Moderna yeah. is only for third shot for those that, quote unquote, may potentially have immunocompromised medical okay. conditions. Okay. okay. So there is a there is a, a priority a, there. There is a priority. Okay. Now, the boosters, the priority is 65 and older, or those individuals that have high risk of exposure, healthcare professionals, EMS. So basically safety. what we did when we were When we triaging. started it. The when tier we one. triaged. Okay. We went to the healthcare providers, EMS, public safety first, and then we started drilling down on our highest, most vulnerable population, our homebound, our 65 and older. And as you go through the different agencies and functions of the health department, from our communicable disease, our cancer screening programs for breast and colorectal, our adult evaluation services, our mobile integrated community health program, which was a key factor in hitting all of our homebounds and our senior housing. That unit did as many vaccinations, and I think it was close to almost 1,200 vaccines alone by this group to homebound and senior citizens. We do reproductive health, adult alcohol and substance abuse services. Queen Anne County Goes Purple program was a major piece of the work that we were doing. As far as the Narcan, we are giving Narcan out to the community as much as we can. We're running our peer program for any overdoses so that the peers have a chance to interact with the individual as well as the families. One major concern that I need to bring to the attention of the commissioners, and especially coming out of MACO, Wits et cetera. The state has decided to divest themselves of ownership within three to five years. So that means we may potentially lose our only inpatient treatment facility in the entire midshore. It's something that has to be on your radar. This is something that we need to really be mindful of because I talked to Bill Webb, the health officer from Kent, he made it very clear, Kent County does not have the funding to take over that building or maintain that building. And when that building is closed down, there's no other facility that he can trans transition to. <clears throat> That's something you need to be aware of. Can you get the financials for that for us, Doc? Uh, what the operational is there? And that, uh, that would have to come from Bill. But we'll try and reach out to him and see what he would say. Be like the community college, it can be a regional. <coughs> <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. We just need to know what the numbers are because you got to know what you're dealing with. I mean, we certainly can't have it shut down. I think it has been brought up to look at this as a regional approach to five right. jurisdictions. Yeah. Like the community just, college. And just the like we the did counties. with yeah. Chesapeake Community right. College. Right. What the numbers will be, what the building will be, I don't know. And what the cost of repair there is because it's been neglected for so long. Environmental health during the entire pandemic was out in the field. They were doing their site plans, their zoning, their well testing. 
septics, and we just got a report from the state on compliance with our VAT program. We are 94% compliant with our VAT, which is really critical when you start looking at nitrogen. <coughs> Excuse me, and our capabilities. Child safety seat program, immunization, infants and toddlers. Our WIC program, helping with new mothers and infants. And we have a WIC van now where we can actually go to the community and do the service in the community instead of having them all come to the health department and physical. <clears throat> so in advance of all the support for 2022, gentlemen, thank you for your support. And we will move forward with these programs. Now, Question, sir. Yes, sir. On the PCPs, is so it looks like Shore is going to be opening there urgent, which I suppose would alleviate that to some minor extent, correct? An urgent care center in yeah. Queen Anne would be good, like nighttime pediatrics, where if you have a sick child or you have a minor ed injury or you're just not feeling well, that could be, that's comparable to going in for a physician's office visit if your physician can see you. Right now is the problem getting an appointment with physicians. Well, I think that's the question I was asking. Is it, is it not the case that the PCP offices are pretty backed up once you get in? I mean, it's tough to get in and it's not going to be an urgent appointment most of the time because of the backlog. Remember now, so many people did not go for routine yearly checks or screenings. I think that's why we're seeing a significant increase in our number of EMS calls and the severity of the COPD, the stroke risk, the congestive heart failure, and even the MIs. So diabetics, we've had a lot of really significant out of control diabetic issues. So. No, I would strongly recommend and support an urgent care by sure. And I think ideally it would be very, very convenient if it was run by the docs that run the ER so that there is a con continuity of understanding what is needed with an urgent care and, and the difference between an urgent care and a freestanding emergency room. If that medical staff and nursing staff can do that in a combined collaborative effort, I think it would make a big difference. That's something I've talked to Shore about. We'll see what happens. I certainly got the impression from Kozell when he was up here that he was committed to... There, I think they are committed to it. I think UMS corporate, now I haven't had an UMS corporate meeting as a board member to know where UMS corporate stands, but they're still negotiating the lease with the previous owner. So right. that seems to be more of a legal and entanglement for getting the verbiage on that lease agreement. Do you think it would help Cozell or help that happen if this commission made a resolution or is there any intervention that we I could think do that, that would be useful or is it all? I think it's a question of what the attorneys can agree on. Okay. Any other questions? What do we do with mental health to, I mean, that number is staggering, the disparity about the professionals that we have for probably those who need mental health treatment, and I think it's hard <clears throat> to get that. What do we do to get more mental health professionals over here? Wish I had an answer for you. I think that's one of the priorities I keep pushing with Shore and Ops Corporate about getting us the baseline services that we need in these five jurisdictions. Granted, they're supposed to be covering the mid-shore. Thankfully, we do have some mental health available to us in Anne Arundel, but not to the degree that we need it in the mid-shore. Any other questions? No. Wow. Okay. Thanks, hey, stop. Thank you. Thank you. Want to take a break before I give you COVID? No. Okay. Bring it on. Bring it on, gentlemen. Put the next slide up. There's the bugger. <laughs> There's the spikes. So, next slide. Oh, I got it. All right. 
March of 2020 to December of 2020. Total number of cases in that period of time were 2,077. And it's broken down, as you can see, by age group. And I'm sorry the font and the numbers are not bigger for those of us that are distance impaired. And even on this gray number on a black background, I'm sitting here thinking, oh my. <laughs> But you can see the first column is zero to five, the number of cases in blue, and then it's broken down by female and male. Six to 11, 12 to 17, and then you start getting into the interesting numbers. 18 to 39, 40 to 59, 60 to 79, and then 80 to 99. So our highest presented, presenting groups were essentially our 18 to 60 year olds. <laughs> Mr. Duminu, does that I, I, put I you in that theory, group? I have a theory as to why uh -huh. the, the, the age from 18 to 59, what they're doing with their weekends. Yeah. <laughs> so you know the struggle we had. We had to do a regional approach to testing. We couldn't get testing supplies. And when we did get them, they allocated us 300 a week. What are you going to do with 300 test kits a week when you've got a population of what you thought was 50,000? Mm -hmm. So there was a real shortage of testing material. And if we hadn't done a regional approach at Chesapeake College with the other health departments, we wouldn't have had enough tests to even start doing these numbers. Because trying to contain this by quarantining and isolation doesn't work if you can't test them. So it became a real challenge. 20, March 2020 to December 2020, deaths. Death by age group. We had 24 deaths in that time frame. And when you look at the ages, thankfully, we had no one under the age of 40 expire from COVID. But when you start looking at that 60 to 79, you're looking at a significant increase, just about 10. Our primary death rate was 80 to 100, which we expect, okay? They have the most serious comorbidities, their immune response is limited, and most of these 18 of the individuals were actually residents in a nursing home, long-term residents. Here we go. January 21 to October 4th. Now, we, when we made the presentation in order to get in your mailbag, we stopped our data on 10-4. Total number of cases, 3,120. So total, as of the 4th of October, we're sitting at almost 5,200 cases in our population. But you're sitting at over 35% over more, it seems, from a year before. And year before is when all the lockdown was occurring. Yeah. So, but well, and we started know. we started vaccinating the very last week of December, and we also had difficulty getting vaccine, as you all remember. Yeah, we begged, we borrowed, and sometimes we did a little under the table, <laughs> but we got it. <laughs> Total cases. Now, this is important for you to hear. As of tonight, 512, we are sitting at 5,339. Okay. Deaths. January 21 to October 4th, 2021. 35 deaths. So as of the 4th, we were sitting at 60 deaths. Tonight, 
we've lost two more individuals in the community. We're at 62 deaths. Okay, I'm going to ask that question. The, so the 35 deaths that have occurred this year, how many were unvaccinated? That is a difficult question to answer because unless we go through every single death report and pull it up in Immunet or CRISP, mm -hmm. it's difficult to tell. But the majority of the deaths have been unvaccinated in those individual cases that we've been able to explore and evaluate. We have hired through Maxim another epidemiologist since our previous epidemiologist visa expired. Mm -hmm. And we're using a contracted epidemiologist, and that's one of the critical issues I'm having him really investigate. So I think as we go forward, I will have that number. Now, the other number that we really need to know about is breakthroughs. Breakthrough cases are occurring. And for the public, breakthrough, break, break breakthrough case is a positive PCR test with an individual who has been fully vaccinated. Hmm. Fully vaccinated, you mean it's been two weeks since you got your last vaccine dose? That you're covered, right. exactly. Now, this covers all three of them, Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J. &J. Okay, well, you, I'm gonna ask that other question. You gotta break it down. I know we do. Yeah. But okay. I can't right now. Right, I understand, but that's that because that, that's that's the piece that we all need to know. Right now, I can break it down a little bit when we get to our 12 to 18 year or 12 to 17 year olds, because I know they're but only getting they Pfizer. Right, right. And of the 60 cases that we have had positive in that age, or the 60 individuals have had it, only nine had a breakthrough. Only nine. So it's less. It's about 10 percent a little less so but that the only reason we know that but those that, individuals uh, uh, hospitalized or not hospitalized? No. right just no. that's the thing the hospitalizations are occurring in non-vaccinated now we have had a few that have been breakthroughs that are vaccinated that need to be hospitalized okay any breakthrough deaths but aren't they comorbidities there's significant comorbidities. And I can pull the 62 deaths, right. and that's what I have Dr. Akeen doing. He's pulling every single one of the deaths since we started vaccinating at the de end of December and looking at comorbidity, vaccination or not, time of vaccination, and what vaccine. This is stuff we need to know mm -hmm. as we go forward. Now, Unbeknownst to any of us in the health departments, when Walgreens and CVS started vaccinating the nursing homes, somehow the governor had made a very quiet arrangement that those individuals were then starting to get blood draws to check their antibody levels. And that's why three weeks ago, or whatever it was, about three weeks ago, when the governor came out and said, he's authorizing boosters for 65 and older, because what they were seeing is a decrease in the antibody, quantitative antibody level in those nursing home patients. But what were they giving them? Well. Which one, Johnson & Johnson? Mostly Pfizer. Okay. Johnson & Johnson, remember, didn't come on the scene right. till later in the picture, but the, nursing homes through those pharmacies, they were using Pfizer. So it's going to be very interesting to see, but that's why the whole FDA push, because the governor was ahead of the ball game when he pushed for booster shots. And really, he was asking us to do off-labeling vaccination. But now I know why, because they had actually been studying what the antibody level was but that was not really made public, mm. okay? Mm. And the FDA right now, as you know, is looking at vaccine for Pfizer for the five to 12 year old or five to 11 year old. And there's still quite a bit of debate about what the FDA, what ASEP 
ASEP is the group of physicians that evaluate the studies and then what the CDC recommendation is going to be. But let's look at where we are. Fully vaccinated population of Queen Anne County is about 59%. Now, that includes all of your 12 and under, mm -hmm. which don't have an opportunity to get vaccinated. How many is that? Six, seven thousand, five thousand? Probably, I'd say anywhere from seven to eight thousand. Okay. Now, 12 and older, we vaccinated 68% of that population. Mm -hmm. That's good. Now, 65 and older is sitting at 89%. We can't do any better than that, folks, because when you look at flu vaccination, about 55% of our population gets a flu shot. All right. This shows you what has been going on since March of 2020 and these spikes, these peaks, because we all thought first week of tour June. Oh, man, we got summer. This thing's down. We're seeing very little, if any, cases. <coughs> but what happened around the middle of July? We started going up and we kept going up and we're still going up. When I pulled these numbers on the 11th and compared them to the 4th of October, on the 4th of October, we had, I believe, 60 positive cases for October. Seven days later, we had 191. We had a 218 percent increase in positive cases in one week. So when you start looking at that graph and where we are tonight, the 12th, we're sitting at 210 cases already for October. We have data on where the increase, where those people got it from. Was there <clears throat> events they were at outside at bars or? That's like the that. contact I, tracing that we're. I'm more concerned if they're hospitalized. Hospitalized, we have eight individuals in the hospital. Eight That's out. been pretty stable, eight for the last three weeks. So what I'm getting at is that number you just gave us, none of those were hospitalized at this present time? There were one Okay. past week. Right. The week before, like two, I think two and a half, three weeks ago, we had five deaths in one week. But they were all elderly. Most of our deaths are 70 and older with significant comorbidities, primarily congestive heart disease, COPD, or marked obesity. And but you look at the graph, and I expect probably we get through October, because this is all Delta. This is the Delta variant. Now, as far as schools are concerned, yeah, we're seeing cases in kids. And from the data I'm looking at, when I look at the daily report on their ages, we're ranging anywhere from five to maybe eight cases a day in our under 12 population. Okay. No, and I hear me, no hospitalizations in any of our pediatric cases. But if that's true, Doc, that's a lot. You figure five to eight a day for three weeks. Well, good many of that and I don't know if Dr. Salins has. Well, well, let me ask you a question. The common cold, the flu. I mean, I, I know you don't try because most people to get it don't go to the doctors. They just go home and they just wait it out. Well, and the other thing is we don't know how many of them are having COVID at home, and right. it's just self-reporting or keeping the child out of school. And we also have an RSV virus, the respiratory virus, which is really causing more of a major impact in our pediatric ICUs on the Western Shore. Now, granted, we have no pediatric IC over here. We have a few beds in Peninsula, but nothing in the mid-shore. And we have assurances from Shore Health and Dr. Huffner, their chief medical officer, any pediatric patient that needs ICU is transferred either to the University of Maryland downtown or to Hopkins. Sir. At this point in time, we are not seeing any hospitalized children. Isn't Explain this one to me. Isn't it a 
health benefit to the system to have a fairly high rate of infection and no hospitalizations because what you're doing is building up building herd immunity. Yeah, you're so, building the immunity so in fact, that we all aren't need. those numbers in fact not threatening? They're not. Yeah. Pediatric numbers are right now, and I'll say this with all candor, for not scaring me. We start seeing them in the hospital, that's a different story. Right. Okay? Well, and I think, again, once we find out uh, those deaths in vaccinated versus unvaccinated, I think is the, the number we need to focus well, on because... That's, that's a critical piece, but I think that you've got to look at the big picture and look at the total picture of what are the pre-existing conditions, how long after they were vaccinated did they then get COVID? If, because if in if fact, they seeing, were vaccinated. If they were. Mm -hmm. Because if we now know that that 65 and 70-year-old with a lot of comorbidities have been vaccinated, and four to six months later, their vaccination level is only at 40% of what it had been, that tells us that maybe, yeah, we got to be pushing more on boosters. But I don't know. I'm no doctor, but I got to say that Queen Anne's County delving out the Moderna got the the we right got, one, right we shot. Got, we got the better end of it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Gentlemen, that's about it for tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. Right now, just Pfizer for 12 and up, right? Yes. What about, <clears throat> what do we hear about when it might be available for Moderna? Three weeks? I thought somebody said. They're talking right now. They're looking at Pfizer maybe by the eight next week and a half to two weeks no Pfizer for younger but I'm saying for Moderna for the 12 to 18 year olds when would that be available talking three to four weeks okay so okay <clears throat> the questions and I know it was more than 15 minutes that's all right it's all good Margie you didn't set a clock on him no I didn't know <laughs> should have <laughs> gentlemen thank thanks you. Doc. see you doc